All right, now that we've discussed uh, the molecular uh, structure of RNA and DNA, now we can start looking at chromosome organization and how we take this overall chromosome and um, wrap it up and keep it from getting tangled um, for the molecular structure of these chromosomes. So we're going to start off on a simple level, and you uh, will need to be able to describe the organization of sites along a bacterial chromosome. So we're going to start off with something small, bacterial chromosomes. So again, we just used a, the word chromosome to refer to the structures um, that contain all of the, the genetic material. And while this chiefly contains DNA, what I want you to recognize is that this DNA is in complex with a slew of many different proteins. Um, the genome comprises all of the genetic material in an organism. In bacteria, typically the entire genome is housed in one singular circular chromosome. So this is a piece of DNA that doesn't have a beginning or an end. It forms a, a loop or a circle. In eukaryotes, um, we typically have several chromosomes that hold the entire genome. And typically our uh, chromosomes are linear as well. So let's take a look at some of the sequences that happen in um, our chromosome. So first we have um, those regions of DNA that produce the synthesis of RNA and cellular proteins. So this RNA could be um, transfer RNAs or the RNA that is found in ribosomes, we refer to that as rRNA. There are also several other types of RNAs that have different jobs uh, that occur. We will get into that later. But we are also talking about all of the sequences that encode for messenger RNAs that are then going to sequence for all of these cellular proteins. And most students kind of stop at this level and think about it that way. What I want you to recognize is that there are several other pieces of the chromosome and those pieces, while they do not encode for RNA or proteins, have specific jobs. So an example of this would be the replication of the chromosome itself. There has to be a site, at least one, to tell the chromosome, okay, when I replicate, I'm going to start right here. And we'll, we'll talk about the mechanics of that uh, in the next chapter. There's also going to be sections that segregate the chromosome into different regions. And this provides a level of organization for inside of the cell. Um, certain regions of a cell may be needed for day-to-day -day activity, other regions may only be needed occasionally. So by, by breaking these up into smaller chunks, we can um, help control that level of expression. So we have sequences that demark where these, these interfaces are, where those separations are. There are also regions of, of the chromosome that facilitate the compaction process. It provides a starting point um, to allow the DNA to start to package up and wrap up, which we'll be talking about in greater detail here shortly. So bacterial chromosome um, can range in size. So E. coli has uh, about 4.6 million base pairs. Others may have a very uh, much smaller. So um, H. Uh, influenzae is only about 1.8 million base pairs. 
one of the difference here is this species in particular is a pathogenic species. It cannot live in the environment. E. coli can live in the environment. E. coli consequently needs to have the ability to make a slew of different things because it might be on its own. This organism, since it might be living inside of the human body, is supplied with a feast of everything it could possibly want. Consequently, it doesn't need to keep all the genes to make all that stuff. Now, in bacteria, um, each individual bacterial chromosome usually only has um, on the order of thousands of, of different genes. And the bulk of the bacterial DNA is made up of these genes and those um, RNA um, templates that will be used. There are regions um, that are adjacent to the genes that are called intergenetic regions. Now, these intergenetic regions um, are oftentimes involved in regulating uh, the different genes. So here, here we have a rough schematic, a uh, circular DNA chromosome from bacteria. These little uh, black brackets are indicating specific genes. Again, this may encode for a messenger RNA, which will lead to a protein, or it could be uh, in code for a transfer RNA or a ribosomal RNA or and many of the others. The regions in between those genes are called intergenetic regions. They are involved in regulatory processes, so they can either help upregulate or downregulate the amount of messenger RNA that is being produced for a specific gene. These regions can also be involved in um, helping to package up um, the DNA or to hide certain regions of DNA at particular points in time. We also have these regions that are have very repetitive sequence structures in it. We'll call that repetitive sequences. You can see them interspersed throughout here. These tend to play a role in the overall structure and organization of the chromosome itself. So there will be proteins that recognize the sequences that are repetitive in here and can help um, facilitate the organization, both separating different regions, so this would be one region, this would be another region, but it might also uh, facilitate proteins uh, coming in binding here um, to compact this structure. We also have a region here that is called the origin of replication. It's typically a few hundred nucleotides in length. Um, and this is the point at which specific proteins will come in, start opening up the chromosome in order to facilitate the replication process. Now, I want you to be able to outline uh, the two processes that make bacterial chromosomes more compact, and I also want you to be able to describe how DNA gyrase alters supercoiling. So let's get into that. So here we have a bacteria, and this is actually two bacteria, and it is stained so the DNA glows brightly. Okay, it's fluorescently labeled. You can see that the DNA doesn't occupy the entire region. So although it, uh, bacteria does not have a, a membrane-bound nucleus, it does have a region that the DNA is confined to, and we refer to that as the nucleoid. Now, the DNA is um, organized, and one way that the DNA is organized is you take those repetitive sequences, you bind specific DNA binding proteins to it, and those DNA binding proteins also bind themselves. This forms all of these loop structures. 
right? So now we have a circle and we've converted it into something that looks roughly like a flower. These different loop domains provide organizational structure within the cell. So you might see all of similar functions delegated to one specific loop. And another loop would be uh, organized for other activities. Now, um, E. coli has about 50 to 100 of these different loops, and each loop can have 40 to 80,000 base pairs in them. This single step of binding proteins to it and binding them to each other to create this flower shape provides about a tenfold compaction, okay? But this isn't enough. What we actually need is about a thousandfold compaction in order to fit the DNA chromosome inside of the bacteria. Remember that that bacteria are very, very, very small. So we need about a thousandfold compaction. This is only tenfold. So how do we get the additional parts of it? Well, that is achieved through something called DNA supercoiling. DNA supercoiling is the equivalent of taking an old school um, phone cord and getting extra wraps in it, and that causes it to twist up on itself. So you can see here that we've taken the flower structure, and each one of these loops have been compacted, and it's been compacted by essentially cutting the DNA and twisting it around itself so it wraps up a little extra tightly. Okay. And this provides the rest of the compaction necessary. So again, we have the circle over here. We have the loop structures that we get with this DNA binding proteins. And then we get supercoiling, super and that makes it much, much smaller. Now, supercoiling is achieved, like I said, by rotating the DNA around itself. So if you were to take a stretch of DNA and were to bind each end to some type of plate, and we were to take one end and rotate it left-handed, essentially unwinding the helix in, a, in one full circle, so 360 degrees, the DNA essentially has two options. It could either form a helix that has fewer turns, but this is not stable. Okay? The other alternative is the DNA can start twisting up on itself, so you still have the native 10 base pairs per, per turn, but now you have this little extra twist around itself, which we will refer to as a negative supercoil. This is stable and is smaller. If we take this and instead of um, unwinding it, if we overwind it, trying to make the helix even tighter, uh, and it might be helpful to think of the DNA as a, a slinky. Um, so you can imagine twisting a slinky to, to try and open it up or to try and twist it tighter. So in this case, if we're trying to twist it tighter, what this would do is create a tighter structure with more turns. Again, this would be unstable. This would have about 8.3 base pairs per turn. And there's too much tension in here, and the structure doesn't hold up well. As an alternative, it could create a positive supercoil, so twisting around itself to take up or release that extra tension that we've created. And that allows the DNA to form its native uh, helical shape, but in much smaller space. 